So hello again. Uh, I am here today with Niels Jens van Rensburg from the Bible Society. He's the CEO of the Bible Society. I've known Niels for a few years now and uh, really got to enjoy um, knowing him and the ministry of the Bible Society, which also involves manna. But we'll talk to Niels now. Hello, Niels, live from Auckland. Hi, Dave, and so, so grateful to be here with you today, obviously sharing some experiences, going back some way, so really appreciate the, way, the work of Authentic Magazine and Authentic Media. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, been wonderful to partner together um, on the Authentic Magazine project. It's been uh, coming up three years now, and um, obviously a vital partner for us being able to distribute. But um, this, this is kind of strange. It's interesting that we're talking to you because you've been one of our main partners as far as distributing the magazine. And of course, with COVID um, sneaking up and, and biting us, then we had to um, shift gears. I'm sure you have, and you can tell us about that in a, in a moment. So this is our first digital edition, um, kind of live-ish, but video rather than print. So uh, mm. although we're still committed to print and we're looking forward to getting back to print and having something that can be passed over the fence and left on a coffee table, which of course videos can't. But the good thing is from the platforms that we're using, so Facebook and then our website, people will be able to link off to other things and learn more and find out more. So we'll get to that. Um, Niels, you're not from this part of the world like me. You uh, came to New Zealand um, because it's delightful. Uh, where are you from? Tell us a bit about you. Thanks, Dave. Yes, I'm from South Africa. I moved here with my family around a uh, little bit more than 10 years ago. Um, and what an interesting journey. Uh, what an interesting way to en enlarge, can I say, your worldview about different contexts, different way people worship, but also different way businesses and uh, people operate. So it's been a great journey for us, a lot of learnings, a lot of things we had to unlearn uh, from our own context and relearn within a new context. But at the same time, you know, I've embraced the beauty of New Zealand, embraced the different things that New Zealand presents, but also the richness amongst the people that we, we sort of feed from, but at the same time have an opportunity to feed into. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, it is a wonderful place for wonderful people. Uh, lots of different backgrounds and cultures. I'm still learning Kiwi culture and I've been here 11 years. Um, so tell us a little bit about the Bible Society uh, what it is, what it does. I know next year will be 175 years of the Bible Society. So I'm not expecting you to tell us about all those years. I know you haven't, you certainly haven't been around all of those. <laughs> so tell us a bit about the Bible Society. Yeah, very excited to share about Bible Society because Bible Society, I think, apart from a few government organizations uh, like the Defense Force and the police, we are the oldest mission organization in New Zealand. So obviously come a long way with mission, a long way with the Bible, a long way with, uh, you know, a rich fucker papa that we can actually embrace, you know, how Maori helped us, you know, develop where we are today as a Bible society, the influence that that have on uh, Christianity within New Zealand. Um, you know, if you think about Bible society, uh, you know, at the early stages of, of the starting up of it, you know, there was a lot of focus on translation and of course, foundational thing about Bible Society is translating the scriptures into the mother tongue where people can engage much more effectively and efficiently with it. But translation in itself is not fruitful unless you do the publishing of the scripture, unless you do the distribution of that scripture, and of course, the engagement of that scripture. So we see ourselves as an end-to-end -end agency. In other words, we start with the translation project, we see the process through and we obviously get the end product out into the hands of people. And then, of course, pray that the Lord will put it into their hearts through the power of his spirit and through the engagement. But Bible Society is more than just that. Uh, even though that is the roots and we still continue with translation because languages are dynamic and you have to update it all the time. But we also think about how does the Bible change lives of people? So our mission statement is, is pure and simple. And I do believe that our mission statement is not just our mission statement, it is our collective statement as a New Zealand church to say we need to make the Bible more accessible to people, everyone, and to encourage interaction with it. And what do we mean by accessibility? We believe people learn best if they can read the scriptures in their own, own heart language, so whatever their mother tongue might be, 
And then also to go on a journey of, now that I've learned and read these scriptures, how did these scriptures become real to me? So we are very passionate about, you know, not just putting the Bible into them, but sort of servicing the church and helping the church to say, what can we do to help people understand who they are in context of that, what many seem to see as a sacred scripture? Yes, it is. But it's also a scripture that's contemporary enough for our culture of today. Uh, speaking into the life that we are today and what the life that we need to live for today. Understanding your identity, how that relates to Christ, how that relates to the story of other characters within Scripture, but at the same time, how do I then make my story known to others, allowing that light of Scripture to shine through my life and through the things that I say and do. That's, that's wonderful. The, the, uh, ex- what I get excited about when I hear you talk is I know it's not just about producing Bibles in languages. Mm. It's about helping people engage. And that's so, mm. so good. You know, I've got friends in the States that produce, uh, um, they call Streetlights, this audio Bible. It's all done with hip hop, deliberately to mm. engage um, kids in Chicago and gangs and things like that. And these kids are listening to uh, hip hop, the Bible being read in hip hop. They've, they've connected with that community, which is awesome. You've got some projects which I particularly have taken, um, uh, caught my eye. One was the the Kiwi Audio Bible, read by oh. the sultry voice of my old mate, Andrew Urquhart from Rima. Um, tell us about how that project and how it came about. And again, a great, exciting project that came to fruition. I think, um, if you think about the work and Bible work in New Zealand, it's not the work of just one entity or one organization. Again, as I say, I want to emphasize the word partnership. Um, that wouldn't have been possible without the partnership of Rayma and Andrew Urquhart, of course, being the reader, have done a great job on it. But if we take it a few steps back, again, when we think about our mission, making the Bible accessible, part of that would be is how do we reach audiences that may not, that may not, may not be able to read? You know, they may be illiterate or people that have got visual impediments. You know, they struggle to read. And the audio Bible was a good part of that sort of thinking to say, this is one way how we can make scripture accessible to people to listen to the word. And we all know what the scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And even as I play that in my car, hearing the word of God, suddenly something new are being revealed to you. So thinking about that, initially we only did the New Testament. And at the time we, um, when we did the New Testament, There wasn't really an appetite to buy this. There wasn't really an appetite for people to say, well, yes, we need this. And a few years down the line, again, we thought about, well, let's do the full Bible, not just the New Testament component of it. Let's do a full new Bible. And uh, then again, partnership with Rhema, completed the project. And for some reason, at that point in time, and again, it's about divine appointments, God's divine timing, Mm -hmm. suddenly the audio Bible took off and people really could relate to it. People sitting in traffic like myself every day, great opportunity to engage with Scripture, great opportunity to get revelation from the Lord. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. Um, and Andrew and I have become friends over the years. There's something kind of weird about listening to him read the Bible as I fall asleep at night, but it's really good as well as being really weird. <laughs> hey, another project which um, I really, really like is the Field Guide to the Bible, a book which really helps people that maybe see the Bible as a little bit scary, it's a little bit overwhelming, uh, unpacks it brilliantly, gives um, really clear introductions to Scripture. Um, again, tell us a little bit about that project. Mm. So when I think about the Field God of a Bible, it's again a great example of a product or a resource that we decided to develop listening to the church. So we were having conversations within the youth space specifically because we had a strong feeling that, uh, and when you look at the statistics, when young people leave school and they go to uni or when they leave the nest, there's a big dip in them engaging with scripture, going to church and continuing their faith journey. Uh, also doing a survey across uh, New Zealand, of course, within your general demographic, you look at you know, what is people engagement with scripture? Why do they struggle to read the Bible? And what are the barriers that they experience? So. We actually had a cohort of different youth pastors and youth leaders sitting with our youth and children's ministry specialists at the time. And they sort of feed ideas into how can we make the Bible easily understandable to people that want to engage with Bible, especially young people. So initially the resource was developed to 
make more sense of the sacred scripture for young people as they come to faith. But then we also discovered that the churches have been asking for a long time and may not, may not, maybe not, uh, you know, some of the big churches, but more the traditional churches that says, well, we do not have capacity on people discipling others. We have a pastor that's, you know, he's doing the sermon. He's actually doing everything in the church, but we don't have all these other programs and streams. So how do we help them? And we discovered that this resource is not only very great for, you know, engaging young people, but also for, for churches as a whole, where some new people are making a decision for the Lord, saying, now suddenly I have to engage with the scripture, but how do I do it? And a field guide of the Bible or field guide to the Bible is a resource that spoke into that area. So not only did we make a resource that makes the Bible more accessible to people, but it also helps them engage effectively with the story and the narrative of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. One story that includes us. And that resource has been really been fruitful for us. Um, and, you know, obviously I had a lot of good testimonies come as a result of people engaging with it. Yeah, it's great. I, I, I've heard it described as giving a pair of reading glasses to someone that doesn't see particularly well. It's that yes. tool to help them see and understand. So it's wonderful. That leads us on quite nicely to how you distribute that. So I alluded to it earlier. Some folk may not know that the Bible Society actually purchased Manor stores in 2017, was it? Or around That's right, that time? July 2017. Okay, so coming up three years uh, around about the time we started Authentic. That's interesting. Um, mm. So obviously, from Manor's point of view, that was great having the partnership with Bible Society. In the last couple of months, I'm sure there's been some challenges having retail stores. But what's the, what's the current vision for Manor stores? What can you tell us about that? Uh, and uh, thanks for asking that question, though, because I think there's a lot of confusion, maybe, with people understanding Bible Society relationship with Mana Stores. So, of course, Bible Society have acquired Mana Stores as part of our engagement with communities. Of course, Bible Society can't be everywhere the Bible is. Uh, Mana Stores have a footprint across the country, and we felt that during that time, as much as it's not creating revenue for mission, it does create an opportunity to engage with communities where they are, which made it easier for us as Bible Society to have access to communities through the 14 stores or through our retail arm uh, on the web or the trade on the web. So it gave us an opportunity to say we have much more resources we can make available to our communities. Remember, we're now living in a multicultural context. Uh, we've got a lot of people that think traditionally. We've got a lot of people that think that only one path or this one piece is true. But the Bible is the one thing that connects us all. And uh, through our network, we really see that relationship of us in Bible society focusing on the mission side of how do we make resources that actually help people engage better with scripture? How do we make resources that speaks into things like trauma healing from the Bible's perspective? So producing the Bible that is there for people, but at the same time, explaining things out, coming out of the word of God to say, how do I deal with anxiety? How do I deal with depression? How do I deal with trauma? Um, how do I deal with challenges that I'm experiencing in life? So whilst we can focus on Bible society side, on the mission side, MANA can focus on resourcing our communities with resources that's relevant to the context that they're in. That's, that's really good to hear. The, um, the current state of retail, I mean, with online purchasing, I know you have that division, but uh, online uh, retail is, is a struggle, has been a struggle. And now with COVID, the last couple of months, I'm sure has been incredibly challenging. Um, what's your view now going forward? Uh, I mean, something I know I've shared with you, I get quite passionate about how important it is to have stores in our communities. I, I like saving money like everybody else, but um, I think we all need to realize if we all buy online, especially from outside of New Zealand, then we're damaging um, ministries, especially like, like Manor, and potentially means we might not have a store in our community. So yeah. I do actively encourage that, but what, what can you tell us about Manor stores and their, the role they play and then how we can um, help make sure that they, they remain in our communities. Mm. Uh, if you think about the, the Christian book retail per se, if I can just give sort of a synopsis, if you think about the global context of Christian book selling has become very limited uh, 
Many may, may know or may not know that some of the biggest publishers in the US have closed down all their bookstores. So we talk about 800 Christian bookstores that have closed across the US in the last three years. A chain of 540 stores and another chain of 370 stores have closed down just as recently as last year. So where do people now go for Christian resources? Yes, we can go to an Amazon online or a book depository. You might save a few bucks there, but uh, we believe that relationship is, is what brings people also to the Bible. Because you might bluntly buy something online, you might save a few bucks, but when you come into a manor branch, you are not only exposed to the price, but you're also exposed to the people. You're also exposed to the mission, and you're also exposed to hearing stories of transformation and change, which is not something that you experience online. And yes, we have the strong drive in New Zealand, and hopefully many, in many other contexts, is support local. And we can appreciate that, as with the donation side of things for Bible Society, you know, it's been tough for us. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't uh, debate around that. But we also believe that God has called us for a time such as this. We also believe that it's God's work. It's not our work. We're all just, you know, uh, partner, partnering with him as we're going through this. So on the manner side, yes, there's the reality of its retail. It can only function if people support it and go and buy at the local bookstore. But there's also the reality for us as a group to say, um, if we are not making profit in certain areas, we cannot sustain the ministry or the mission within that specific geographical area. And for us, the mission is what is important, is to keep on get engaging people with scripture. So man is one part of that mission of making the resources accessible, but if it's not profitable in a certain area, we obviously will have to make the decision about how do we then continue the mission in that space. So. We really call upon people and we believe even during COVID, we've experienced what I would call sacrificial giving with people, even though they may have not been able to afford it, they said, I believe so much in the mission of the Bible that I'm going to give whatever I can afford to give at this point. And we are very grateful for that. Uh, well, that's, that's exciting to hear that. Uh, and I'm feeling that across New Zealand, there are people saying, you know, let's club together and support one another, support local, support national so that's good. And I mean, I know you're looking, always looking at new opportunities and online offering and how you can, um, you know, get the, the services and the products more available. But one of the things I've, I've loved is going into a manor store. I've usually got an idea of what I want, but I can go and chat to the friendly lady at the counter who will often point me to something that saves me 20 minutes of looking all around the, the place. And, um, you know, until, until they can get a website to do that, that's always an advantage that you've got. So I really do that's hope you stay. I've said to you, you know, I'd love love a, a flat white on the way in. I don't know whether we can make that work, but we'll, we can keep talking about that. <laughs> hey, um, it's great. And I know you're, you're very passionate about the ministry that you um, lead and serve. So that's really exciting. Um, and I know it's very genuine, but you're also a uh, normal human being person uh, that's been locked down for a couple of weeks um, with your family. Uh, I get those really encouraging messages that you do send out um, from time to time, which is really good. And what else have you been doing at home when you've, um, in, I know you've still been working, but what other things have you been doing or new things that you've been doing? What's been a highlight of lockdown for you? I think uh, from a personal point of view, if we talk about the family context, um, I think this was a good time for us to just rediscover the strengths that each of our relationships have, you know, whether it's husband and wife, uh, whether it's with my two daughters, whether with my dog, you know, all of them have got their own unique perspective they bring to. But it's also, it was also a time of rethinking as a family as to what has God called us to and how are we going about what God has called us to. At the same time, it strengthened our relationships, uh, not only individually, but as a collective, you know, how we do things as a family collectively, because that's the spirit of God's word. Uh, I'm a firm believer that as the husband to my wife, and as a father to my children, that is my calling. That's my main calling. Mm -hmm. And I have to lead them in that way. Uh, being entrusted with the CEO position of the Bible Society Group is also part of my calling, but it's not the only calling that I have. First and foremost, my responsibility is towards my family. And you know what? They are the ones that I go and, you know, blow off steam if need be. Uh, but at the same time, I have to manage, you know, what is important for them or what's too heavy for them to carry and what not. 
Um, so, of course, there's a few other things that you would have learned from your family during this time. What are the pressure points? What are the things that makes them stress about conversations you normally wouldn't have had in the normal course of things? But I think the great thing of all about this was, you know, really getting a deeper relationship and understanding with God. I think there was more that personal engagement and it reminded me of the home churches in the book of Acts, you know, where uh, I did say to somebody the other day, the one good thing about COVID is that it's created a church without walls, mm. you know, and that has brought church right back to where it initially started. Yes, we can gather in the building, but that does not stop at the building. We also as individuals, which is the koinonia, we can gather as individuals as the church and really engage on that level with each other. So individually, collectively, but also as a church family, even having church online, having to do a sermon here and there online, you know, it's, it's, it's a new era. And I, I also, uh, you know, reminded even our team at Bible Society that we should be very careful to be, um, I don't want to use the word indoctrinated, but uh, to be uh, put in that space where we constantly hear the words like, what is our new normal? Social distancing, physical distancing. That's not God's way. When what I love about God is he doesn't, you know, he takes the ordinary and does things extraordinary and through ordinary people. God functions within the abnormal sphere. And that's really great for me. So I try to, to stay away. We don't want to be conditioned to talk about new normal all the time. We actually are conditioned to say, we always live in the abnormal. Every day is new. Every day is a new opportunity and uh, conditioning ourselves in that way to, to live in that sort of realm. That's, um, again, really encouraging. It, it, similar to some of the de devotions that you sent through, which, again, are really encouraging. There's a, a Bible teacher inside that CEO, husband, and father as well, isn't there? <laughs> which is really yeah. good. Um, so, Niels, really do appreciate you and uh, the work and... Um, and also you're making yourself available for this um, time to support our, our issue 10 and encourage our listeners. I was going to say readers. They are our readers mm -hmm. as well. Um, we have, uh, we'll have links on there to, to how people can get in touch, but the Bible society.org.nz is the, the website here. And then Mana simply Mana M A W N A dot co dot N Z for the, uh, the online store tells all about the retail um, yeah. ministry as well so well, big thank you um, very much appreciate uh, having you and I look forward to seeing you in person relatively soon for decent coffee thank you so much Dave and thank you to the work that Authentic is doing and I appreciate our partnership and long may partnerships grow and continue amongst other ministries as well Amen